and i believe that we have just started broadcasting uh, good evening kevin how are you uh good evening thank you for having me you're welcome thank you for cleaning your schedule and for being with us here yes, so pleasure. good evening to all our viewers uh, i just want to make uh, sure first that uh, we are broadcasting and we're not talking just you and me <laughs> so i just want to enter to amazon non-stop group and see that people can see and hear us let me make sure amazon non-stop okay so let's enter to the chat yeah i can see both of us and i can see a few uh, viewers that are joining to the broadcast right now and uh, guys if you if everything is okay you can just can you can just try it hi hello to tell us how you feel tonight and of course i see the first lady of amazon non-stop as usual honey doer sheffer writing to us hi guys looking great she talking about me of course just yeah. kidding <laughs> and um okay Hanit, thank you for that the first lady of amazon non-stop she earned this title with honor trust me so guys before we start i want to make sure that everybody share this uh, interesting presentation that waiting for us that we will start uh, present to you kevin will start present to you in a few minutes but you know other people can join can enjoy it and other people can find it relevant so please if you have a relevant group or even in your own profile you can share it now it will help us our group and to kevin and maybe to other people so thank you for that and uh, kevin let's wait another minute or two sure. until all the other viewers join us until then i just want to thank you again for cleaning up your schedule for us and of course i want to thank gilad who introduced us and yes. uh, okay so kevin how do you feel i feel good uh where are you broadcasting from tonight tonight or or in your place it's afternoon it's i don't tonight know somewhere and it sounds like it's tonight in israel but um <laughs> i'm in uh south florida southeast florida south florida okay it's nice place to be there right now the weather is great right yeah weather is good pretty much year round can't complain the, too much the atmosphere is nice everything is quiet is nice. no incidents yes. <laughs> well <laughs> well okay i'm sure okay, there's some great. incident somewhere but uh, yeah, yeah, nothing yeah, around okay. me thankfully yeah, yeah, yeah. okay so okay i believe there is a nice amount of viewers now so it's a good time to ask uh, what uh, we will talk about tonight and uh, for those who don't know who are you kevin sanderson uh, yeah, thank you. My name is Kevin Sanderson uh, from Maximizing E-Commerce. I've been selling on Amazon myself since 2015, uh, where I started dabbling in retail arbitrage. And I uh, decided that I wanted to start my own brand in early 2016, launched that, and very quickly learned there's a whole different, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can go to grow your business, but some are easier than others. And I was finding international selling as one of the uh, much easier especially when you compare it to the return of uh results that you'll get on the back end uh than a lot of other things and so i've been focusing on that and uh helping other people do the same okay great because usually it sounds very difficult for us so maybe you will uh, simple as you, you you will you will make it simple for us tonight and that's my uh, goal yeah and i just want uh, to tell you that after three years of broadcasting uh, you are the first guest that uh, standing while uh, he is uh, presenting uh, his virtual presentation. So thank you for that. I know that you just keep trying to keep your energy and you, yeah, it's professional. And well, uh, we can see all the boxes around. The atmosphere is of Amazon sellers. So, yeah. <laughs> so for me, it's really special broadcast tonight. So I think it's a good time to start to start that live. And uh, I know that you prepared some uh, presentation. Uh huh. And uh, I do have some slides. Yeah. So can we start? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we'll we'll okay, go ahead and get great. into it. So let me uh, pull up PowerPoint on my side. I I just want to show to everybody the first slide. Look at his Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time researching. No, I, I don't know Hebrew at all. Uh, I've read the Old Testament, um, at least as I would refer to it as the Old Testament. 
uh, which was originally written in Hebrew, but that's about as far as it goes. And that's uh, your, your, your Hebrew English. is better than mine, English. So, <laughs> well, gotcha. And I have to say, in all in all truthfulness, uh, I just borrowed that graphic from the uh, Facebook group. So that you just borrow it. You're going to return it after. I will. I will. So when I'm done, <laughs> don't, I'll, don't forget I'll, I'll, it. Instead of don't copy and paste it, it, I'll cut and paste it. I'll, okay, I'll cut okay, it back. Okay, so okay, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So right. let's start, of course. Uh, and I just want to uh, to to make our group remember that, as usual, you can ask questions. You can just ask something that uh, will be uh, like. Just ask a relevant question, and I will forward the questions to Kevin. And sure. Kevin, ready to start? Let's go. It's going to be interesting broadcast. Yes, yes. Again, thank you for having me. And again, I don't speak Hebrew. Although it's interesting is I grew up in Texas, which is, you know, the middle of uh, southern U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, one of my buddies from, like, third grade on, he now works for the U.S. State Department. He had mm -hmm. worked in Israel twice for a long time in fact he even married an israeli woman oh no they've got a couple of kids now and everything and funny they just moved to fort lauderdale about a year ago which is about an hour south of where i live so uh my 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 friend from childhood who married someone from israel lived in israel for a long time that now lives like an hour away from me so just a random side note okay so i don't think he perfect. speaks much hebrew himself but <laughs> yeah all right, so just to get into this here, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be talking about and what you're going to learn. So what I'm going to talk about here is why global selling could be for you um, if you're selling on Amazon currently, how to get started selling internationally. We'll go over a simple three-phase process to do that if this sounds of interest to you. And just because I want to also be as upfront that it's not going to be all roses and rainbows and sunshine. There will be some pitfalls to avoid. Um, and we'll help you navigate through that. So uh, as we talked about before, my name is Kevin Sanderson from Maximizing E-Commerce. I also help people expand into international marketplaces. That is my family. That's a somewhat dated picture. I need to probably replace it, but I just really like that picture. Um, it's a, it's I, a beautiful one. Well, thank you. Thank you. It is, it's a very nice picture. Uh, definitely the other three people in the uh, picture helped to make it a very beautiful picture. Uh, my son, the little one there is now about the daughter's size and she's almost the size of her mom. So uh, they've been growing like weeds lately. So and, and you are, are still the same size. Yes, thankfully, I'm still <laughs> not too much bigger than I was. Yeah. Back then. Yes. All right. So who is Kevin? So as I mentioned before, I've been selling on Amazon since 2015, started my own brand uh, back in early 2016. I went international in the fall of 2016, starting with Canada. Um, and since then, it's become a consistent re six-figure revenue stream for me, uh, international sales. That is generally about 30 to 50% of my U.S. sales. Sometimes it just uh, varies depending on the year, but it's been on the higher side of that the last couple of years. Um, and I also help others build their own international empires on Amazon. Um, oops. My mouse is kind of getting a little crazy on me. Uh, you may have seen me on a couple of other, other podcasts, other places. And generally, I do end up talking about the subject of selling internationally. For whatever reason, it just seems to be of things I could talk about, <laughs> what everybody kind of wants to know about. Because I think it is one of those topics that is... Uh, it, it's so impactful and a lot of people are really interested and want to sell internationally, mm -hmm. but it's just those things that kind of hold us back. And so I enjoy teaching folks. I enjoy talking about the subject of international. Um, I, maybe it's cause my mom's a retired teacher. My sister's a principal at an elementary school. My dad had taught at a college at one point. So maybe it's just in my blood, this, uh, yeah, teaching it's in thing. your DNA probably. Yeah, it's it's somewhere deep in the DNA, um, and, and my wife now is a teacher too. She teaches mm. art to so, elementary school kids, so it's just maybe, maybe I'm kind of surrounded by the teaching. The question: What uh, your kids going to be? <laughs> right, maybe a teacher. One day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they're definitely set up for that. Now, um, one time when I was speaking uh, a couple months back. Uh, I was given about 25 minutes to talk on this topic, which is generally on the lower side of time that I get. And the person that it was kind of like back to back to back to back speakers, oops, bought my microphone there. And the person in front of me, 
or the person before me, I should say, uh, went over on time and the meeting planner came to me and said, Hey, can you cut your uh, presentation short? <laughs> like it's already kind of short itself. So it's kind of br browsing through it. And, uh, someone came up to me afterwards and was like, Hey, that's a really good session you gave, but you made it sound almost too easy. So my promise to you is to share with you, not just the good, but also the bad and the ugly. Um, so and then also feel free, uh, gal to, uh, jump in and let me know if, uh, you have any questions along the way as well, just to make sure we sure. got everything clarified for folks. Um, so let's start off with the beginning. So why even sell internationally? So one topic that I've talked about is, um, this concept of if you cast a wider net, you catch more fish because what it comes down to is in business, um, you want to access more potential customers. And so international selling on Amazon, you've already kind of figured out how Amazon works. So you can just take that net, widen it so you can find fish in other places that you wouldn't have otherwise. And another way to look at this that I've kind of thought about fairly recently, I was on a family trip and, um, we were in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Georgia. This was just this past holiday season. And uh, we'll call this the waterfall principle. So that's a picture of, uh, we're walking over this uh, walking bridge. And what you can't see in that picture is if you go up the stream, there was a waterfall that was about 150 feet high. Now, what you can't see in that picture is that there's actually not just one but two waterfalls. So that second waterfall there, I thought was actually a really good analogy for Amazon international sales. The bulk of your sales would still come from the US. But when you think about it, by having two waterfalls, there's more water going down that stream, or in another words, you would have more cash flow going to your business. And so as time goes on, more water is flowing through that stream and you can have more cash flowing through your stream by having international sales. So let's take a look at a, a couple of results from my own business. So this is the holiday season, not this past year, but the year before that. So 2020, um, my sales in the U S for the 30 days leading up to Christmas Eve. So let's just call that the holiday selling period. Uh, -huh. uh we're about $72,000. So just under 72. Um, if you add on my additional sales that I had internationally, it was about 112,000 total. And so that represented a 56% bump on top of my US sales, sales mm -hmm. that I would not have gotten if I didn't take the products that I was already selling and offering them for sale in other marketplaces. Um, now, again, I was going to tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, you know, a lot of times people say, like, oh, it's just growth all the time. Well, 2021, let's be honest, was a challenging year for a variety of uh, reasons. And, you know, as I'm sure we all know, there's a lot of inventory restrictions and, you know, the inventory restrictions hit in pretty much every country, not just the U.S. Um, but the, the good news was towards the end of the year, Amazon started to open up, you know, a lot of that FBA capacity, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that was also in, you know, international markets as well. But that did affect a lot of my inventory planning. So, I ran out of stock in a lot of places, didn't get stock there in time in some cases. So it did have an effect on my sales. So my sales in Amazon in the US this past holiday season, so same 30 day time period leading up to Christmas Eve, um, were about 78,000 in the US. So a little bit up above where they were um, the year before. However, my international sales were a little down year over year. So my total sales were about 105,000. So not quite as big of a bump on top of my US sales, but that was still a 34% bump on top of my US sales. And that's when things weren't going particularly well for a variety of purposes when it came to inventory management. And we all know inventory management can be a headache, but if you think about it, 34%, that's not chump change, you know, especially when you know, we're talking about the busiest time of the year. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, but what about the costs when selling internationally? Well, I think one of the costs we can all uh, think about that is kind of apples to apples across the board on Amazon would be PPC costs. So if we're looking at my PPC costs on Amazon, um, my A costs for paid advertising sales in Amazon in the US for that 
30 day time period leading up to Christmas Eve was 35%. So 35% mm -hmm. ACOS. Now, if you look up north in Canada, it was a 29% ACOS. And in the UK, it was about a 28% ACOS. And so that's all English speaking marketplaces, apples to apples, for the most part, using the same keywords. Um, it was definitely a better uh Def, better cost structure, and especially when we talk about our biggest costs, is generally our PPC costs. So, in a lot of ways, I'm actually bringing more money, dollar for dollar, so to speak, to the bottom line um, for my international sales. Now, a couple little disclaimers I want to give here is anything we're talking about here is not intended to be tax or legal advice. Everybody's business is a little different, and there's so many variables, especially when we talk about international selling. Really, what we're offering you here is information for educational purposes only. So, you know, as a business owner, you still have to discern what is the best thing to do for you and your business. And anything I'm talking about here about results, as we all know, if we've been in business for more than five minutes, we know nothing is guaranteed. And really what it comes down to is uh, there's only one guarantee in business. And that is if you don't take an action, you won't get the results. But if you do take the action, you are setting yourselves up, yourself up to potentially get the results. So a um, couple of things to think about here. I've grown my own international selling empire and I've helped other people's other people do it in their own businesses. And so uh, it, I want to be upfront that it hasn't always been this way. So I started off back in 2015, taking a season's worth of earnings as a high school football official. So you're probably familiar with uh, football like Tom Brady and uh, Emmett Smith. I'm dating myself by mentioning that name from the dynasty days of the Dallas Cowboys, but like Dallas Cowboys and uh, you know, Alabama football and stuff like that. Well, I wasn't doing NFL in college. I was doing high school, uh, but that is me in those two pictures there in the black and white stripes. Uh, and I took the money I earned to put that towards my own brand. And that's how I got started in this business. And um, very quickly, I learned that there's really two major variables when it comes to an e-commerce business and that you have to have products to sell and people to sell them to. And with that, outside of cash, which is an extremely important thing, our most valuable resource that we cannot renew, and that is time. Time always moves forward. We can get figure out ways to get more money, but we can never get more time. Uh, we can buy other people's time, but as time marches on, you know, if once it's a year from now, it's a year from now. We can't go back in time. So, um, as I was trying to figure out, like at the time, I still had a full time job. And want to figure out like, okay, what are the different ways that I could grow my business? And so I started thinking about like, okay, I want to go into some of the uh, marketplaces off Amazon. And so some of them I worked really hard to do. And they're not even around like jet.com. Uh, when I got into this business, people were actually talking about Sears.com. Like it was a viable, like almost in the way that people talk about Walmart today, which we'll talk a little bit about Walmart here in just a second. Some of these I couldn't even get approved for because maybe my products didn't necessarily fit their marketplace. I don't even know is Newegg even still around anymore. Um, so just it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be to break out of Amazon and learn these new marketplaces. And so my dream with Walmart, and we'll bring it into more recentness was that, you know, you just turn it on and just like Amazon you got sales coming in and there's been lots and lots of talk about Walmart lately. Uh, when I was at Prosper, there was an <clears throat> international selling, um, what's the word I'm looking for a track. So if you were at Prosper show, you probably know they had different tracks of, uh, you know, topics that you could go back to back, you know, all day long in one particular room and you know, hear a bunch of different people talk about particular subjects. So international selling had a track. I think influencer marketing had a track. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a track for Walmart and the Walmart one was actually really, um, really something that people were excited about. And I think it's because there's a lot of buzz around it, but let's talk about the reality of Walmart. And so with Walmart, the algorithm is completely different. So the algorithm, as much as Amazon sometimes gets hammered for uh, favoring their own brands, al the algorithm at Walmart seems to be even more favorable to that. And when Walmart is in the buy box, um, 
or is selling the product. I guess they don't use the term buy box like Amazon does. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing with Walmart is you got to completely rewrite your listings. Your and pretty much anyone who's an uh, a Walmart guru or someone who you know understands Walmart well. Uh, will tell you you got to completely rewrite your listings it's almost like the algorithm for walmart was written to dissuade kind of the style of listings on amazon so they want it to be written very differently um and the back end system you're talking about the content of the listing oh yeah the content of the listings. what is the main reason that we need to rewrite our listings amazon doesn't seem to mind keyword stuffing quite as much mm. as Walmart does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Walmart. Um, yeah, yeah. I actually personally had the, that experience with Walmart. I have a Walmart account and they uh, suspended my listings, but Amazon did it as well. So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> gotcha, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it, it, it's a completely different algorithm that's looking for different things. Uh, Amazon doesn't give you the same scoring system. So one of the things I think that, that Walmart at least does well is they give you this kind of automated scoring system of your um, Does anyone of your listings. know what is the scoring system of Walmart? Like, I, I, I feel that we don't have enough information yet. No, but... and there's not great information out there on a lot of it. Um, it's like a lot of Walmart. They, they did a lot of buzz about that that they will support uh, Walmart since now, but they, I, I didn't find any useful information there. Nothing. Yeah, I think there's more hype around Walmart because yeah. I, I think long term, it will be a good marketplace to go to. Like, I'm not disparaging Walmart. I'm not saying don't go there. Um, but what I came to find is what is it's not as simple as FBA. In fact, if you want to yeah. get on WFS, the Walmart fulfillment system, it's not the same as like you yeah. sign up for an account with Amazon and you're basically I, I, did FBM their, right I did their FBM, but it was super surprising for me. Super surprising. Oh, zero, yeah. zero, zero advertising. And it like this, the, the, the results were like outstanding. Yeah. And there is PPC that you can eventually kind of aspire to. Um, and I, what I'm saying, I, about... I didn't understand yet how, how to use it. Like, can you believe me? I have a Walmart account for six months, but I still trying to figure out what's going on there. Oh, absolutely. And when you think about Walmart, the, uh, the thing about the, their, their version of PPC is they're way behind Amazon. So Amazon, it's like, you know, there's all these bells and whistles and things you could do these levers you can pull to, to update things it's nowhere near like that on mm -hmm. walmart and unless you're like ranked a certain amount you can't even get access to the ppc as i understand it mm -hmm. i i don't really understand it either so i'm not here professing to be a walmart expert and some of the reason is quite honestly the results so let's talk about my own results from walmart from this holiday season so this is an actual screenshot from walmart seller center um, for the time period we were looking at before, basically the 30 days leading up to December 24th, Christmas Eve, uh, my sales were $176. That's not missing uh, commas or zeros. That's that's $176. And you can see below there, um, below that uh, second arrow, the green there says 1100% uh, up compared to the year before. Cause I think I made like one sale. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely could have been better. So in comparison, Walmart, the $176 in sales I made in Walmart uh, were dwarfed by my Amazon Australia sales, uh, which were not particularly high. Australia is still a relatively slow marketplace, but still Australia beat out my Walmart sales uh, about three to one. So let's talk about another dream that a lot of times we have is that we can build our own store and we can get consistent sales. We can own all the customer data. We don't have to pay 15% commission to Amazon. And we're just going to build this store. You build it and they will come. So you may be familiar with the Field of Dreams. It was a movie from the 80s here in the US where... There was this Kevin Costner, the actor, kept hearing voices. If you build it, they will come. But then you realize quickly that is not the reality. You can't just build a website and hope that people come. The <clears throat> reality when you build your own store is it can be almost overwhelming the options of what you can do. And you get stuck worrying about, you know, 
trying to code a button to look a certain way, but it's like, does that even really matter? Uh, so you start focusing on the things that don't matter. Um, your conversions are never quite anywhere near what they are on Amazon when you have your own store. Uh, Facebook ads tend to be very expensive and don't work for most products. Um, if you have a recurring product, then maybe it could work for you, but um, it can be very expensive selling uh, with Facebook ads. And you can also do SEO for free search engine optimization, but it takes a lot of time for Google to recognize your products and start giving you consistent sales. So during the holiday selling period, my sales in my Shopify store were about two hundred and sixteen dollars, which was uh, better than the Walmart. <laughs> better than Walmart. Beat Walmart. There's always a positive. It was about yeah. half of my Amazon Italian sales. In Italy is okay, I guess, but like nowhere near as uh, good as like uh, Germany or UK or Canada for my experience and for most people. So uh, just to think of it this way, when you're trying to think about what are you going to do next in your business, whether you want to focus on international sales channels or going off Amazon, uh, you got to ask yourself, which has higher potential results, uh, which allows you to use your current skill set that you've figured out from selling on Amazon in the US, and which is going to actually long-term be less time to figure out how to get results, especially once you're already launched, because you already know how Amazon works. So you're taking those existence, existing skill sets and going to some place where you have the best potential for results. It just makes the most sense, in my opinion, and from what I've seen with other people. And so I would say the verdict is in, and that is Amazon International is an amazing opportunity if done right. And so uh, we're going to go through, again, the good, the bad, and the ugly and help you figure out the setting up of it. So think of it this way. I've done it. Others have done it. So uh, maybe you're watching this and you have done it, but maybe you've not. So if not you, why not? And so let's help you put the pieces of the puzzle together so that you can create your own international selling empire. So if you're thinking about your own path to global domination, I think there's a good way to go about it. So if you understand the U.S., and a lot of people watching this are in Israel, um, but you still understand how customers buy things in the U.S., Canada is going to be your closest comparison. And so the results tend to be pretty good in Canada. Uh, the words people use to describe things tend to be uh, very similar to the words people use in uh, the U S so, you know, think about like keywords and things of that nature. So you can do well in Canada. And then I would take your skill set from expanding into Canada, which is going to be a little different than the U S but not too terribly different. And the government is super nice actually, if you have to work with them on stuff. Uh, then if you go to the UK, things start getting a lot more complicated. Now you got value added tax, although you do have a tax, uh, sales tax in Canada called GST, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but you, you have to now start factoring in the value added taxes included in the selling price. Um, I'm not sure how, how are taxes, is there a sales tax or a value added tax in Israel? Sorry. Is there a value added tax in Israel? Yeah. Oh, okay, so you're probably familiar. So I, I mm -hmm. don't know how it operates, but maybe you uh, are more comfortable than a lot of Americans uh, selling into Europe because if uh, you're already familiar with how value-added tax works, just understand there's always going to be nuances because even within Europe, there's nuances. So I would say Germany would be a good next place and potentially selling into the rest of Europe and to the European Union nation countries, especially the established ones like France, Italy, and Spain. Um, and then from there, maybe start looking into Australia, maybe Japan, Japan. I basically started there and sold out of what I was selling about two and a half years later. Just didn't quite get the results I was hoping for. Um, and maybe start going into Mexico. Mexico is a lot more challenging to figure out and in, Comparing notes with a lot of people, the sales, if you look at like, uh, pick your favorite software tool, I won't say names, that you use to figure out demand on Amazon. Uh, it works. In, those tools generally work in a lot of these marketplaces, but um, 
what people generally tell me is in Mexico, the numbers tend to be a little inflated. So not really sure how their algorithms work, but they tend to give a little too much favorability to what sales potential might be in Mexico. And there's just a lot more administrative hoops you have to jump through in Mexico to sell there. So I would go there last in this journey. I just uh, mapped out here for you. So let's talk a little bit about how to sell internationally. So as I promised before, there's a three phase process. So phase one would be to register. So generally speaking, there's going to be some sort of registration you have to do with a government entity, whether for a business number, some sort of import number, uh, maybe the GST or the VAT or the something There's something you generally have to register for. And then while you're waiting for the registration to come back, because usually it's not just a overnight, they just give you whatever numbers you're trying to register for. Uh, there is some stuff you can do to get set up, uh, adding listings, converting them into whatever currency, uh, also making sure that your uh, <clears throat> listings are localized. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to sell English listings in Germany, for example. And then once you're up and running, uh, and you've got a plan for sending an inventory, then now you've got something you have to manage in your business. And then from there, uh, the bonus is that you want to rinse and repeat and just keep doing this in more marketplaces to keep bringing you more cash flow into your stream. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about phase one registering. Excuse me. It's All okay. right. So first thing you're going to do in Canada is fill out form RC1, as in Revenue Canada Form 1. Uh, you're going to fill it out for parts A, B, and F to get a business number, GST, HST number, as well as import, export. And so that's going to give you uh, the, the numbers you need to be able to sell in Canada to... Uh, charge the sales tax and get the operates kind of like a value added tax and to get the credit for the, uh, what you pay at the border, um, as well as having the registration number to get your goods across the border. So then from there, you're going to, let's say you're going to register in can, Europe. Can, can, I stop, can I stop you for a second? Because Please do. I, we have two really relevant questions about Go Canada. for it. And uh, for the first question of Gidon is uh, for the Canada market. Are there a lot of benefits of shipping inventory to Amazon warehouse in Canada than using Amazon remote fulfillment? And if so, what are those benefits? And uh, really close uh, question of many. What about remote fulfillment in Canada and Mexico via Amazon United States? Will it be good start with... Uh, a good start with that point of reference before doing the jump to moving inventory. Yes. So there's a couple caveats with the remote fulfillment program is Amazon's now in the responsibility uh, for importing your goods into Canada. Yeah. So many, many of the, the products are completely different countries, even yeah, though and many of the products are not allowed from my experience. Like exactly. I tried, yeah, I try to do it. But for example, if the if the product is okay for selling on um, on uh, in Canada, would you? Yeah. Recommend so let's say the product is okay for selling in Canada. So always think of it: what is the customer's perspective, and how does the algorithm favor the customer? And mm -hmm. so think of it this way: if you're the customer, let's say you're going to get a case for your phone, mm -hmm. and you're looking at two different cases. One. It's prime. It comes to your door within a couple of days, free shipping. Another one, you got to pay extra for shipping. It's shipping from the U S it's going to take longer and you got to make a deposit for duties. Okay. Which would you buy? The, the, you're... the answer is really easy. Okay. I understand. Yeah. And so sometimes depending on your niche, you might do okay. I've heard some people say one, two, maybe three or 4%. Um, if you're doing NARF, which if people are willing to buy with those additional hoops, generally you'll have better sales with mm -hmm. FBA. If you're ready to just dive in and do local FBA, then uh, it's not unusual to get 
four or five times the sales, if not more, that you would have gotten in NARF. And so mm -hmm. NARF, I said, was maybe three, four percent. FBA could be 10 to 20, 25 percent or more. I've seen with some folks, their sales so, in Canada compared to their U.S. sales. So it's not a good reference to start with the um, remote fulfillment service because it wouldn't show the real amount of products that I'm able to sell on Canada if I would be like a prime seller, FBA seller. Uh, let's just say this, like there's no downside necessarily to doing remote fulfillment and worst case scenario, they just say, no, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, why not? But, but, but just it's, no. it, it doesn't, it, it wouldn't show the real potential of your- uh, Correct. Product. Okay. Correct. So if you're like, oh, sales aren't that big in Canada. Well, here's the challenge. A lot of sellers just say, I'm just mm -hmm. going to turn on remote fulfillment and not go through these hoops, which is why there generally is a lot less competition in Canada for local FBA inventory. And if you're the algorithm for ranking purposes, or if you're you know sharing the buy box, wholesale, mm -hmm. retail arbitrage, which do you think is going to get you the buy box? Of course. Yeah. No. So- yeah. Just some things to think about there. So yeah, great questions there. Great questions. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. So now let's jump across the pond and talk about registering in Europe. So in Europe, you need a VAT number and an EORI number. VAT, I'm sure it sounds like everyone would be familiar with what that general concept is, the value added tax. Uh, EORI, I always forget what it stands for, but let's just call it your import registration number for Europe. Now, what trips people up? Is that now that the UK is separate from the EU because of Brexit, which I'm sure we've all heard about, but the challenge is that they may use the same terminology, but it's now completely different. So UK is its own separate thing and the EU is its own separate thing. Kind of like if you're shipping goods from uh, you know, Israel to the US, completely different countries, it's kind of that way now for UK and EU. Um, so the simplest way with value added tax in Europe, because as I mentioned, there's a lot of nuance to it and it can change sometimes in even between countries. So to keep this very simple, you generally need to get a VAT number and it's required if you're planning to store or import goods into a country. Now there's some exceptions and whatnot to the rule. So I highly recommend talking to a qualified VAT agent. Um, what I will say is when you go to talk to someone about VAT, my suggestion is start simple. You can always complicate things later because what will happen is whether it's a, an accountant that handles VAT or Amazon, both parties want to really suggest to you to just register everywhere. Uh -huh. It's... One of those things we say here in the U.S. Sometimes it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's easy to get it out. It's they can make it very relatively easy to register, but then it's kind of a headache trying to deregister from all these countries. Whereas I think it's better just to start simple. You can import into, let's say, Germany, store your goods in Germany, and sell the customers in France and Spain and Italy from Germany, and that actually works better than storing goods in the U S and trying to ship to, um, to Canada from a customer perspective, because there it's almost like storing goods in North Carolina and shipping to customers in Texas, for example. So like States within the U S member nations are kind of like States in the, European Union, except you would need to be registered for VAT if you're going to actually store goods in that country, but you don't necessarily have to, to get started. Now, there are some uh, fulfillment fee benefits for doing that, but sometimes the cost of compliance will outweigh the, uh, the benefits in doing so. so. But while you're registering for whatever it is, uh, we can start working on phase two, which is getting set up. So getting your account and everything uh, else in order. And the mindset is it's kind of like a starting line. So the, the, the clock kind of starts once you've submitted whatever applications you need to submit to 
you know, whether it be the Canadian Revenue Agency or Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs or whatever they call the German tax authorities or whoever you're working with. And um, your mindset is you can't control how long a government takes to give you registration numbers back, but you can control start to adding your listings in the other country using your ASIN or UPC code. Um, it'll generally match and bring over all of your images. Uh, and oftentimes it'll also bring over your reviews, although I've seen exceptions to that for no explainable reason lately as to why sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But if it does work, great. Uh, but you can also be focusing on uh, making sure you got your ducks in a row with inventory, whether you, let's say, have some of the 3PL in uh, California and you're just waiting to send that up to Canada as a test order or you have some with a supplier in China or India, and you're just like, please hold it until I'm ready to ship into Europe, or whatever the case is. So you've got all those things lined up. Uh, maybe you've got your listings translated, you've figured out the profitability, and so you've got good pricing, and not just, uh, oh, just figure out whatever the uh, exchange rate is, and multiply it times that. You've factored in things like value-added taxes included in the selling price in Europe, where it wouldn't be in Canada, or in the US. And so you're just factoring all those things that might affect your margins so that once you get the numbers, you're ready to go. So as I mentioned, you want to get make sure you have a plan for inventory. So get that ready to go. You've got your pricing decided on. Um, you've added your listings to the marketplaces. And then once you're off to the races and you've got uh, product in these marketplaces, now you want to manage your ongoing sales. And so I don't know if this is an Israel thing, but it's definitely a thing in the US where everyone's most worried about taxes. Generally speaking, and I'm assuming this would be the same way in Israel, sales tax would go to the local government where the sale is made. So, or whatever the jurisdiction is, I should say. So for Canada, it would go to the Canadian Revenue Agency. Um, in Europe, it would generally go to wherever the goods were sold from. Um, and then you've got income tax, which for me, I send to the IRS. And so I just report as part of my sales and my cost structure. And the nice thing is things like QuickBooks and Zero or whatever you use for bookkeeping generally has a version that can do uh, multi-currency. Okay. Um, um, Kevin, can I go back and ask you a question about uh, the VAT? Uh, Gidon asks again, what is the normal average time to get a VAT number? I applied, I applied to the United Kingdom VAT four months ago and still haven't got it. Is it normal? That seems a little long to me. Um, if you're doing this on your own, it can be harder because sometimes it's hard enough working with a uh, an accountant or somebody in an accounting office who's collecting paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, it can be hard enough sometimes understanding what they're even asking for, uh, mm -hmm. just because even though it's in English, just the words used to describe certain things from a business compliance standpoint could be different. Um, but it shouldn't take four months. I know they were behind for a while because of COVID, um, but I would definitely, if this person is working with a VAT agent, I would call them tomorrow. Um, most places close at five UK time, which is actually pretty close to Israel time relative mm -hmm. to the U S being a lot different. Um, uh, but I would call and just have somebody explain why is it taking so long? Because the UK government oftentimes comes back and forth with, we want this document. No, that's not the right document. We uh -huh. changed it last week. We need this thing. It's a, it's a very, oh, so there's a lot of bureaucratic red tape in Europe uh -huh. and the UK is not immune to that. Uh -huh. And so you could be stuck in, they want a different version of a screenshot because now all of a sudden they want, uh, Okay, so it, the answer look is a little, little different bit, or something. Little, little bit uh, long. It's not really normal, and it's a good idea to check what's going on there. And another question of Sagi. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, like, what is what is better to open your uh, Europe account from your uh, United States uh, from your North American, and then open like 
to enter to your North American account and then uh, open your Europe account or you, or just open your European account from scratch? I would go through your, and some of this is probably because you used to not be able to do it this way. You had uh-huh. to create a European account and try to link them. And it was sometimes a little challenging. I would just go inventory, sell globally, which is and probably then, what they're describing. And then go through it that way to start uh-huh. your uh, European account. Uh-huh. I would go that route. Okay, great. And I see that somebody wrote th- another question. Uh, again, Gonen, I have another test account. I registered for Amazon Europe and once I completed it. Uh, the account was open for 10 minutes and then Amazon disabled the, the European accounts asking for more documents for ver- verification. I'm using the same address what is already approved for my United States account. What do you recommend doing? Uh, Amazon sometimes will close accounts right yeah, away. Sometimes, yeah, uh, for, that, no, for no reason. Well, and sometimes that's just the process. So it yeah. sounds scary, but it just means they need documents. So in Europe, there's a lot of KYC laws, know your customer laws that have to do with financial. And so they can get hung up on a lot of different things. And so... Um, Wait, I have a question. I don't know if he is a company or not, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Are we able to open a European account for individuals? You should be able to. Every, just about everyone I've worked with has had a separate company, but I don't know of any reason why you wouldn't be able to because you can register for a VAT number okay. as so, an individual. So, so I don't as, see any reason as why Israeli you be able individual to. without a company, I can be, I, I should be able to open to create a European account. I don't know any reason why you wouldn't be able to. But it's, it doesn't that. matter because he just showed that he have United United Kingdom United Kingdom based company. So, oh, I, no I believe that the question is really general. It's maybe millions of reasons, and uh, I'm not sure if we're able to provide some answers. Maybe. Yeah, the, the hard part is there can be a lack of transparency sometimes from the teams that handle these things is what they come back for. And apparently some of the problem is they have like very little amount of space to communicate back with you the way that the system works. And so they might be checking a box because it's the closest thing to be able to describe what they need, but it makes no sense to the end user. So you might have to just keep asking questions, keep okay. putting in support cases and trying to know why. But like anything with Amazon, sometimes you just got to use uh, persistence to get through. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we can continue. Say, okay. Thank you. Sure. Answer. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah. So, back to taxes. You get generally two buckets of taxes. Sales tax goes to the local government. And then you have income tax, which goes to your government. And then from there, you want to rinse and repeat. So, then from uh, the UK, you can go into Germany, Italy, France, Spain, Australia, Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of different places you can go. Now, the thing of it is, as we all know, and I kind of described a little bit there, there are some hoops you have to jump through. But unlike the well-trained dolphin jumping through the hoop, sometimes for us, it can be more like feeling like you're jumping through a hoop of fire. And so just to show you some things you might encounter along the way, uh, some might be catalog issues, especially in Europe. <coughs> Excuse me. Um With these, they can be a little bit challenging, but like anything with Amazon, sometimes you just got to keep asking the question slightly differently, try different ways to get it in. But eventually you can get your listings added. It just, it can be a little bit of a hassle sometimes on the front end. Um, Sometimes the logistics can be a little confusing, but with a lot of things, you actually get better with it over time. In fact, at the panel I was on in Prosper, there was a gentleman who is, I believe it was an eight-figure seller, And he was saying the way he looks at it is international selling actually helps him manage logistics because he tells his factory, okay, um, I want to order X number of units of this product and, you know, this product and this product. And then when it's ready to ship, he says, okay, now I want to send a certain number of units to the UK, a certain number of units to the U S to Canada, to Australia, to wherever. And so he's found it to be a good way to help him manage his logistics by not having to 
um, have just one place to send that it gives him more places to send. And so if you start seeing it's some products might slow down in one country versus another, um, he just can send less to the country it's slowing down on and maybe you can pick up some of the slack in the UK or Canada. If it, the U S is slowing down, for example, uh, compliance, it seems like there's always something new, but the good news is, uh, especially in Europe, there's a lot of stuff going on there with compliance. Um, good news is there's people that can help you with it. Um, so make sure to at least understand the basics of what you need to be responsible for. And then sometimes also, I think there's some over promises from service providers out there who maybe they only understand one piece of the puzzle. So, you know, they've never actually sold on Amazon in some cases, but they might have like really good niche expertise when it comes to one thing on Amazon, um, whether it be tax compliance or, uh, you know, I'm not picking on any particular person or company, but, you know, there's just some people out there that I've heard speaking on the subject um, that they maybe handle, you know, they're a, a freight forwarder or something. And, you know, they, they understand they're part of the puzzle, but they might not understand the whole thing. So they make it all the rest of it sound so easy because, you know, they want you to keep shipping stuff or they want you to keep translating stuff or keep, doing tax filings or whatever the case is. And so I've seen it in forums and groups where sometimes people make it sound way too easy, um, which I try not to be guilty of it. And so try to give you the realistic picture. Um, and having done it myself, I can tell you all these things are easily overcome with time and understanding. Um, you can get there. Oh, and also Amazon can be guilty of making it seem easier than what it really is. Wait, another Kevin, th Kevin, yeah. do you do you offer like any services in this field? Uh, I do have some services to help okay. people go so, through so, that. We, we can so get to that. We, we will get to that. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'd be more than happy to help folks out with that. So great. Uh, great. Thank you for asking that question. So, um, and also one of the things Amazon does sometimes is uh, we probably get these emails where it's like, you know, go to the Middle East, go to Singapore, go to Turkey, go here, go there. <laughs> and, you know, one time somebody was sending me this like really passionate email about it. It's like, you know, but I really think if I went to the UAE, I could really dominate there. I'm like, well, maybe you could be dominate and be in the number one position on first page, but for what? And so if he's been in all the other different countries and UAE is next, sure. Why not trust out UAE? But if, spending the time to figure out how to launch in UAE prevents you from going into Canada or the UK or Germany or someplace where by and large, most sellers do overwhelmingly better there just because they're also more established marketplaces. Mm -hmm. Whereas customers in a lot of these newer marketplaces are still trying to figure it out. And Amazon is trying to get more products in these marketplaces. So that's why they're courting sellers to go there. So could it be worth your time? Maybe, but only if it's not at the expense of going into the uh, the blue chip um, marketplaces like Canada and UK, where you're going to generally see a lot better sales. Um, now, it can feel a little bit like climbing up a mountain and yeah. you know, you're trying to figure all this out. But the good news is once you get to the other side, there is the promised land huh. of additional sales. Um and, you know, there are people that can help you with all this stuff. And so, uh, you know, whether myself or, you know, again, the service providers with Nick's niche expertise, um, if you want to work with them on, you know, whatever the case is, that's great. Uh, but just always understand at the end of the day, you are going to be responsible for your business. So you want to make sure that you understand the path that you're taking and how it's going to get you to where you're going. So the nice way to look at it is just imagine yourself, what impact would global sales have on your business? Um, and then where could you potentially reinvest the process, uh, yeah. reinvest the profits yeah, or even treat yourself? So um, just to kind of wrap things up, uh, uh, this picture that I showed earlier of the yeah. two waterfalls, imagine having your own waterfall of Amazon international sales that only complements your U S sales and brings you more cash flow over time. So real people, real results. Um, and that next success story with international selling could be you. Oh, you don't have to do it alone. 
a uh, couple resources. You could go to internationalchecklist.com. I have a free download that will walk you through the steps of having to, or uh, of being able to do this. And then um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to Kevin at maximizingecommerce.com. I do offer services uh, both done with you and done for you, depending on whether you want help along the way or you want somebody to just do the bulk of the work for you. Um, so that way you can get closer to international results. And again, internationalchecklist.com and Kevin at maximizingecommerce.com. And I'll open it up to if there's any questions. Great. So thank you for that presentation. And uh, can you return the, the previous slide that people could uh, oh. write your, your email and your uh, details? And uh, I want to ask you if, you, if you're planning to, to stay in our group, you have only one answer. Okay. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for that. People will ask feel free to questions. tag me. <laughs> yeah, you feel free to tag that to tag him. And I can see that we have additional questions or question. Mm -hmm. And like um, we have five more minutes, and you can ask another question. Sure. And Jacob is asking. I opened an account in Amazon Japan. Amazon asked for documents for verify my identity. Uh, I sent them a telephone line translated with a notarized certificate, and yet uh, they don't approve, have an idea how to help me. By the way, I have an active American account for more than three years. Uh, as far as I know, a phone line doesn't work as a verification method. And as I know, usually an electricity, electricity bill or property tax will do. But uh, maybe I'm wrong. Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, it depends on what you talking about the verification, like putting in like a number in. Like, you know, like if, if Amazon's having to call you or text you with a certain number to put it. Yeah, but, 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 but I think that he's talking or about document wise about the next next step of verification. When they ask uh, documentation, they ask for utility bill. And uh, as far as I know, and I opened like, uh, I believe that uh, I, I took a part of opening of hundreds of accounts in Amazon. Mm -hmm. And few, few of them had that problem. Uh, mm. Most of them in the United States, like all, all of them in, in the in the states. Um, phone line never worked for me. Uh, usually it was uh, el electricity bill or um, uh, the property tax. Sometimes Amazon just gets really hung up on subtle differences. So if it was translated, mm -hmm. is it matching other documents that you yeah. have? <laughs> I know, I know Jacob pers personally. So Jacob is professional. I believe that he knows that everything should match. Like we're talking oh, about dots and about uh, capitals and not and and the uh, regular le letters, everything. But um, yeah, I, I don't. I know that from uh, from my experience that sometimes you do everything correct and it still doesn't work. So yeah, and I think we've all had that problem with Amazon. You submit yeah. what they ask you to submit, and then you submit it again, and then you just get the right person. So Jacob, maybe you should open a case and try your luck. I'm I don't know, or maybe yeah. you should tra translate the other uh, document, or maybe first of all you should check that everything is perfectly one hundred percent matching there. Yeah, and so like I, I could see them getting hung up on. Like in the U.S., sometimes we might call a street a drive. Like, you know, live on yeah. Bald Eagle Drive. Yeah. Whereas maybe it's D-R-I-V-E versus D-R. Mm -hmm. If someone doesn't realize that D-R and D-R-I-V-E is the same thing. Okay. Okay. So I can see. Uh, okay. I, I will turn off the presentation. I think that uh, people had enough time to take your uh, sure. details. Yeah. And here we are. Another question of Sagi. If I sell from Germany to other Europe countries, do I have a VAT number? In the, should I have a, a VAT number in these countries? Simplistically, no. You don't mm -hmm. need it. You need it if you're going to import into Germany and store into Germany. You would need a VAT number and an EORI number for Germany. Well, you wouldn't need necessarily. Okay. There, there's there's a lot. I'm trying to keep these things as simple as possible. Simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> just say if you're storing in Germany, you need to have a German VAT number. 
You need okay. a Niori number for some country in Europe to get into any European country, but okay. you would so generally the number, need the VAT number of the country you're going into. The Niori number is the solution for like uh, combining a few countries uh, in Europe under one. Like well, so of. in Europe, you can only have one Iori number. Okay. Like your number, it's for all Europe. It's not for... Correct. Okay. okay. And in Great. most countries, you would also need a VAT number to have the Iori. So the bottom line, I can import to Italy and sell to Germany. Without... Yes. A... Yeah. So if you're, if you're storing in Italy or storing in Germany, wherever you're storing, you mm -hmm. could ship to other customers and... Uh, customers in other countries regardless of whether or not they're buying from amazon germany or amazon italy or amazon france um because it's all within the european union now the uk they're coming up with like the european fulfillment network but it's still new and I they're still getting the kinks out of it and i think it's going to be more like remote fulfillment between canada and the u.s so it's going to have some caveats to it I believe. Well, uh, Kevin, even you tried to make it simple. Amazon Europe is still very complicated for us. And uh, we, are, we are looking for uh, service providers that will help to do everything for us and to establish everything and to make it really simple because we like to sell. We don't like all the bureaucracy behind it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I want to say honestly that uh, it feels like being in your hands and it's being in... Uh, someone professional and uh, and very safe in in, in a very safe person. So well, thank you. I enjoyed that uh, webinar. It was a great uh, hour of presentation and meeting. Appreciate you. that. And uh, I believe that people will uh, forward you more questions or ask for more more yeah, solutions. And uh, personally, I want to say thank you for cleaning your schedule and for being with us. I hope to see you here in the future on or in Israel. If, uh, at least seeing you in the Facebook group, I, I, I can't say no. I've already been told. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Kevin, thank you for everything. And of course, Amazon Nonstop, we will see you in two weeks in another interesting webinar of uh, a huge company that I'm sure that you know. Uh, but I will leave it as a surprise. And meanwhile, at that point of time, I want to uh, say to everybody, Chag Sameach, which is uh, happy holidays because uh, in the clo in the next Friday we will celebrate uh, Passover here in Israel. Mm -hmm. So Chag Sameach and uh, and kosher kosher Passover and happy and kosher Passover to everybody. And we will see you in two in two weeks. And thank you for that uh, again, Kevin. Bye bye.